This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Hear now the word of God for you. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent in those days and told no one of any of the things that they had seen. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy God, who came to this earth in human form to show us how to love and live, we ask that this morning you show us what it means to be transformed, what it means to live into our powerful purpose from you, so that we may live our lives as who we were created to be, as individuals, and as communities. We thank you for the freedom we find in Christ and for your call to come and abide in you. May we have the courage to declare yes and amen. Amen. Something in us changes when we claim our God-given powerful purpose. And when we step into this calling, this purpose, this intersection of your gifts and the needs of the world, a sort of transfiguration happens within us. Each of us have a God-given powerful purpose in this world, and the good news is that each of our purposes are unique and different. Now these callings may shift and be refined throughout our lifetime, And it's not always easy to boldly step up into these ways of being, these ways of abiding in Christ. Throughout this sermon series, we have celebrated and discovered who Jesus is and been invited to learn more about ourselves. And today, we are going to consider what it means to find freedom and transformation in our God-given purpose not only for ourselves, but for others. So now let us turn to the Gospel of Luke and see and hear Jesus' own transfiguration. Just before this passage in verse 18, Jesus asked the disciples, who do others say that I am? And they answered him saying that he is like John the Baptist or maybe Elijah or another powerful prophet. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And while the rest of the disciples remain quiet, Peter answers, you are God's Messiah. And in the very next moment, Jesus affirms this truth by elaborating on his identity, saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things before being killed and resurrected on the third day. 
And then in this story about eight days later, Peter, John, and James go with Jesus to a mountain where they are to pray. And when Jesus begins to pray, his appearance becomes different. His face changed and his clothes were bright as white. As we read in the story, we can perhaps see parallels that you might remember from Moses. Long before Jesus, who came down from Mount Sinai after talking with God, and wasn't aware that his face, his appearance changed after this holy encounter. This encounter that refined his identity as leader and prophet. Glowing, radiant, transformed, people around him a little confused. And now here Jesus is having a similar mountaintop experience. Glowing, radiant, transformed, people a little confused. Just then, the prophets Moses and Elijah are there with Jesus. They are dressed in splendor and glory, and they have come to speak with him about his purpose, his departure that would somehow bring fulfillment to Jerusalem. And you see, these are not just any people to start. They lived quite a bit ago. But more importantly, these are two people who embody God's covenant to God's people. Moses, who represents the law, Elijah, who represents the great prophets. And these half-asleep disciples wake up during this conversation and sort of realize what's going on. But they fail to see that the presence of Moses and Elijah was evidence that Jesus had come to fulfill the law and prophecies. And as Moses and Elijah were leaving, Peter, who is now a little bit more fully awake, but still missing the entire point, mumbles something about putting up shelters for them to stay. Perhaps this is his human longing to hold on to their great presence, or an allusion to the Feast of the Booths, a festival celebrating Moses and the Israelites in the desert and their journey towards freedom. But either way, before anyone can respond, a cloud comes over them on the mountain, and a voice says, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Remember, even Moses only saw the backside of God. So perhaps this cloud was a gracious shield protecting the people on the mountain from the powerful glory of God. And just like that, the prophets were gone. Now, the story doesn't end here. Jesus is transfigured. He has changed, not necessarily in essence, but in how others viewed him and his mission in the world. And now he must come down from the mountain. He must continue his journey, stepping into his God-given powerful purpose. And so immediately, when Jesus and the three disciples come down from the mountain, Jesus is met by a father who has a son and begs Jesus to heal his demon-possessed son. And so Jesus goes, and he does what he does best. He heals. He liberates a child from suffering. And verse 43 the crowd witnessing this healing was astounded by the greatness of God. About five or six years ago, I had acknowledged the calling I had been sensing for quite some time to be a minister. And it was so hard for me to accept this calling, not because I wasn't passionate about it, because I was, but because I had trouble seeing myself going to seminary, taking the steps it takes to become a minister, to get to my calling. Simply put, I had trouble trusting that God would provide for me if I took that leap, if I went down the mountain. And so at this time, when I was figuring all these things out, I was serving in a college ministry, wrestling with questions like, is this just my hobby? Is this my passion? God, what do you want me to do? And on top of that, in the tradition that I come from, it's difficult for those of us who are not straight cisgender men to have the same sort of recognition for their gifts in ministry. 
And therefore, many of the pastors and ministry leaders that I worked with weren't like me. But behind the scenes of it all, I was really excelling in ministry. I found that my passions for spiritual formation and the desire for faith communities on this campus intersected here. There was a need to teach and train up leaders, and I was really good at it. And my mentors began to point this out in me. Taylor, it seems like God is calling you to this space. Still, I was unable to see that the powerful purpose that God had given to me and I was already beginning to do the work that I was meant to do. And so one day I was having coffee with a, a leader that I worked for um, and I was telling him about these anxieties. Should I go to seminary? How would I even do that? Are women allowed to be pastors? <laughs> what is God calling me to? And Deji, um, being much smarter than I was, knew that I already knew the answers to those questions. But what was behind my anxiety was my inability to see the freedom that I would have if I just said yes and amen to God's yes to me. And so instead of solving all of my anxieties, he said, Taylor, I think part of this journey is to be a trailblazer for other people in ministry who share your calling, but maybe can't see their place in ministry yet, like you. And he went on to tell me about how my acceptance of my call that I obviously had been feeling, my yes, would make it that much easier for those who came after me. Those who are called to vocational ministry, to be ministers, pastors, chaplains, and those who are called to do justice within the church in other ways. And I had truly never thought of it that way. I had selfishly been so consumed. What would happen in my life? I never considered who else might be affected by my yes. And so I began to say yes. I think my yes was more of a whisper or a question at first. Yes? Okay, God. <laughs> yes? I didn't have this mountaintop experience like Jesus where ancient prophets came to chat with me and my three best friends. I didn't have God come behind a cloud and tell me that I was chosen. But I did have a transfiguration of sort. I noticed that the more I said yes, the more I wanted to say yes. And now I realize that his words were true. My willingness to accept my call has encouraged and equipped other people to say yes and amen to theirs. Isn't that wonderful how God works? My anxieties and my need for planning and control didn't quite go away after this, but I still had this inner peace that I didn't have before, this glow about me. And when I read this story about Jesus who has changed and the way people viewed him and his mission, I see myself differently too. I can recall the times where I've heard God's voice, Taylor, my child, whom I have chosen for this, not audibly from a cloud, but from preachers, mentors, friends, other people who have said yes and amen to their call and therefore could so easily see mine even when I remained unsure. And the more that I meet others who are saying yes to God's call, whether they are ministers like me or they are others out in the world who are seeking God's love and justice, the more I am aware of how great and powerful God's mission in the world is. And it is in that witness that I gain freedom to keep going too. As we step into our purposes, just as Jesus did on that mountain, we step into a life of freedom, abiding in Christ, living just as we were created to be. We might not all have the same shining glow as Moses and Jesus did, but surely we also shine God's glory through our words, actions, and ways of being when we experience this transformation. Something in us changes when we claim our God-given powerful purpose. 
when you step into the place where your gifts and the world's needs intersect, beyond your nine to five, beyond your job title, your unique God-given purpose to transform the world through justice and love in a way only you can do. And these changes happen best in community. When we look at this significant, albeit pretty confusing story, we see three of Jesus's closest friends witnessing him in his glory. God's spirit shining upon Jesus, hearing the voice of God affirm his mission and authority. I doubt this is something the three of them would ever forget. And though he, Jesus, is the one being changed, others around him gain freedom and acknowledgement of his identity. Not only are the disciples gaining freedom from this experience, but we read this story years and years and years later, and we gain freedom in Christ too. We are shaped by this call. And now I can only wonder how our communities can be shaped by our stories too. Something in you changes when you claim your God-given powerful purpose. These are not all mountaintop experiences, both literally and figuratively. Often this transformation is difficult. Even as God revealed God's self to the world, we know reading further on in the story that the world didn't quite know what to do with that truth. Still, Jesus kept healing, liberating, teaching, inviting people to abide with him. You may be like me, where the fuzziness of my future didn't quite go away after I responded yes to God's call, and I realize now that it's not quite a checkbox that I get to check off one day. Seminary, check, preaching, check. Rather, Parker Palmer reminds us that our vocation is not a goal to be achieved, but a gift to be received. This gift is an ongoing transformation in our communities as we deepen our relationship with Christ. In these communities who echo and remind you of the words, this is my child chosen for this purpose. These are my children chosen for this purpose. Communities that help you learn what it means to come and abide in Christ, saying yes and amen to God's work in our lives. At one point in my ministry, I met a pastor named Momo, and she was actually the first woman I'd ever met to go on to seminary. And as I was being mentored by her and learned from her, a little part of me wasn't afraid anymore. Because Momo, despite the prejudice she might have encountered in the church, she had a certain peace about her, a peace that I identified with. Oops, part of my sermon. She wasn't oblivious to what other people were saying about her identity as a woman in ministry, but her confidence about her powerful purpose came from God and came from within. This internal calling had poured out of her, and as she preached and taught and prayed and listened, it inspired me to do the same. And because I had the privilege of witnessing her call and witnessing the call of others, no matter what their vocation is, the peace about my calling only grows stronger. And I continue to radiate God's glory from within me, knowing that other people are changed too. Something in you changes when you claim your God-given powerful purpose. I wonder if on top of that mountain, Peter, James, John, and even Jesus knew the full impact of his identity as Messiah and chosen. I wonder if they anticipated what would happen next. And though after that experience, the three disciples were quite literally speechless about the transformation I asked myself, what was it like for the nature of his ministry to be affirmed by God's voice? It wouldn't always be an easy path from there, and neither will ours be. But this I know to be true. As you continue to step into your God-given purpose, we as a community will gain freedom from your 
transformation. So let's affirm these truths as a community. And when we are ready, let's come down from the mountain and continue to go where God has called us. Can you hear it? Jesus is speaking to you. This is my child whom I have chosen. Abide with me, abide with me, abide with me. May it be so.